Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Join my VIP program and as a VIP member get a discount, a big discount, on my pronunciation course. Only my VIP members get a discount on my pronunciation course. It's a great combination, VIP plus the pronunciation course at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Let's begin. Chapter five of Animal Farm. The darkness begins. Okay, so we I was just telling people on Facebook Live that really chapter five is when the uh, the really the dark, terrible things begin on the animal farm. So we saw the beginnings. We could see maybe the possibility of some evil happening. A few small things, nothing big though. But in this one, finally, Napoleon will take power and we see that the true evil of, well, what Orwell's saying, the true evil of of communism, of totalitarianism. That's a long word. <laughs> I'll teach that word in a minute again. Totalitarianism. It's a long word, but it's actually quite common. We use it a lot when we talk about politics. So you probably should learn that word. But first, let's just learn the plot, the basic events. What happens in chapter five? Well, I'll go through, I'll tell you what happens, then we'll go back, and then we'll discuss the meaning. George Orwell's kind of obvious meaning, and then maybe some deeper ideas of mine or yours. All right, here we go. Chapter five begins in winter. So winter comes to the farm, so things become tougher, obviously, right? Winter's a hard time on a farm. Nothing grows in the winter. Uh, the first problem that happens Molly. Remember Molly's the girl horse that likes the ribbons and she doesn't like to work. She's kind of lazy. She just likes to look pretty. Well, she starts causing even more problems. She's more troublesome is what the book says. Troublesome, meaning she causes trouble or she's not, uh, not helpful. And what's the problem? Well, the main problem is she doesn't like to work. So she always avoids work. Right? It says that she always has an excuse every morning. She's late every morning for work. And she'll say, oh, I slept too long. She, she says, oh, I have some pain. Oh, I don't feel good. You know, you know these people, right? The people who call their job a lot and say, oh, I'm sick. I can't come. You know, they're always avoiding work, right? So that's kind of what Molly's like. Um, and then she likes to run away during work and just look in the water and look at herself, like looking in a mirror to see if she looks pretty or not. Oh, let me t I'm gonna give you the uh, different view here on the screen. Okay, uh, but then something a little more serious happens. And this, we'll discuss the meaning of this, but um, another one of the uh, horses, I think it's Clover. Yeah, Clover, which is another female horse, I believe, sees Molly at the fence, at the fence of the farm. And Molly is, um, seems to be um, l l talking, or the, uh, the farmer on the other farm is talking to Molly, right? Because horses can't talk to the, the humans. But Clover looks and sees that, you know, Molly's over by the fence and another farmer is talking to her. So Clover comes up to Molly and asks her about this, right? She's very concerned. And she says, uh, you know, Mr. Pilkington, it's the other farmer, the neighbor farmer, Mr. Pilkington. She says, I saw you talking and it looked like he was stroking your nose. He was like petting her nose kind of very nicely. 
What does this mean, Molly? Right, so she's accusing Molly, right? And Molly's being nice to a human. And remember, humans are supposed to be evil. And she's letting the human be nice to her. She's letting the human neighbor talk to her. And so Clover doesn't like this and says, were you doing this, Molly? And then Molly, of course, is, she's kind of scared. She's worried. So she says, uh, it's not true. No, 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 I didn't. She, she's lying. Um, and, she said, and then Clover says, Molly, look in my face. Tell me. Tell me, was he, did you let the man, you know, pet you, stroke your nose? And she says, it isn't true. But she can't look her in the face, right? Because so she's, she's lying. Then uh, Clover goes and searches Molly's stall. A stall is where a horse sleeps, right? It's like the indoor little room for a horse. We call that a stall. So Clover look, searches, okay? This is another thing we'll talk about. But Clover searches her room, her stall, and finds some sugar and some ribbons. Oh, extra sugar and ribbons hidden in Molly's stall, in Molly's room. Uh-oh. So she's getting some kind of gifts, right? She's getting something from the outside. Sugar and the little ribbons. She's not supposed to have those things, but she's getting them from somewhere. Probably made from the other farmer next door. And then what happens next? Three days later, Molly disappeared. She disappears. Poof! She's gone from the farm. And everybody's confused. Nobody knows where, where she is. But then some of the pigeons that fly around, they're kind of like the spies. Right? The pigeons come back and they say they saw her on the other side of Willingdon. I guess that's the town. I'm not sure what Willingdon is. But basically they saw her on another farm. So she, she ran away from Animal Farm. They saw her on another farm. She was um, kind of pulling a little small cart. She had ribbons in her hair. And there was a, a man stroking her nose and feeding her sugar. And she appeared to be very happy, appeared to be enjoying herself. And so it says, none of the animals ever mentioned Molly again. So they never talk about her again. She ran away to another farm, seemed to be happy. So they never talked about this. They didn't, they didn't discuss it. What does it mean? Why did she run away? Why is she happy? They just, ah, oh, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. So they just pretend they don't remember her. More bad stuff happens. The winter's very, very cold, very tough, bad winter. And so <clears throat> they keep having all their meetings and their discussions. But unfortunately, the battle, the, the arguments, the fights, the struggle between Snowball and Napoleon gets worse and worse. So they disagree about everything, every plan. They argue at these meetings. And during the meeting, Snowball always gives great speeches and everybody starts to believe him. But then after the meetings, Napoleon goes kind of one by one and talks to people individually and he changes their minds. So constantly it's back and forth. Some, people, some of the animals supporting Napoleon, some supporting Snowball. Back and forth, just to trying to win more influence. Napoleon also focuses a lot on the sheep. Right? He focuses on the sheep and he, they become very, very loyal to Napoleon. They follow Napoleon completely. And this is a, something else we'll discuss because it's a common technique we see today. Uh, Napoleon gets the sheep that when Snowball is giving a great speech and he's, he's convincing people, and he's re making really good points and saying good things, the sheep will just start to suddenly just start chanting like a slogan. They just say, four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad. And they do this during Snowball's speech. So they, they interrupt Snowball's speech. They kind of make it hard for him to give his speech, right? They're trying, basically what they're trying to do is uh, stop his free speech so, others, so that the other animals can't hear him. And this is something that 
Uh, this Antifa group, if you, I don't know if you've heard of Antifa, they're this kind of communist left-wing group. They do this, and a lot of people on, like, universities in the United States are doing this exact same tactic. So they have a speaker come to their university that they don't like, and maybe the speaker's quite good and very has very good points. So they can't debate this person. So they just, they will break in and they'll do these protests and just start screaming and yelling, you know, no fascists, no fascists, no fascists, or just something, anything. They just start screaming and yelling and try to make it so the person cannot speak. They try to stop the speech by just yelling th these slogans again and again and again. So this is a common tactic, and obviously it was used way back when uh, in the, you know, in the, well, 20s, 30s, 40s, so this is, you know, this tactic is over 100 years old, probably more. So this is uh, what the sheep do, and it's one of Napoleon's tactics to beat Snowball. Now, another point that, uh, in this chapter, Orwell writes, that Napoleon never has any plans of his own. This is another thing we see now, and what we see in a lot of, uh, happen in a lot of, uh, these uh, communist or socialist countries, or even just totalitarian, is that it says Napoleon produces no schemes, no plans of his own. He just criticizes Snowball's plans and say they won't work. So Snowball has lots and lots and lots of plans. He's very intellectual, all kinds of plans to make the farm better, to help everybody. He's always giving speeches and, oh, we'll do this, we'll do this. Lots and lots of plans. But Napoleon never has a plan himself, so he can't be criticized, really, right? He never gives his own plan. He just criticizes Snowball's plans. He just sits back and then tries... He's just negative, completely negative. So he just says, Snowball, it won't work, it won't work, it won't work. Another tactic we see a lot now, where a lot of these revolutionary groups, they're just always attacking and complaining, racism, sexism, ah, all this, but they never have a very good plan themselves, right? They're just attacking the plan or the society, constantly attacking the society or the plan or other people, but they never have much positive to say. They never really try to do much themselves. They just try to destroy and tear down. Okay, now, Snowball's biggest plan is for a windmill, a windmill, you know, windmill, which would create electricity. So Snowball's been reading a lot of, on, of the books on the farm, and he has a plan to make a big windmill to create electricity. And then he tells the animals, we'll have electricity, and we can use these farming machines. We won't have to work. Everything will, will be fantastic. We'll have lots and lots of food, less, less work. So it's this huge, big, big plan, and he makes all these plans, and he draws the plans to design the windmill. He draws it um, on the floor one time. And Napoleon kind of ignores his plans for a while and says he's against it. He says, I'm against the windmill. This is a bad idea. So Napoleon does not want to build the windmill, and Snowball does. However, Napoleon one day secretly... He walks in, and he looks at all of the plans from the windmill. He looks at all of Snowball's plans. He kind of memorizes them to remember them. Then he pees on them. <laughs> so then they have this big um, disagreement. They have another big meeting about this windmill. So the windmill will require a lot of work. It's going to take them, I think he says he thinks it will take a year, maybe two years, to finish the windmill. So lots and lots of extra work. But Snowball says, if they do the extra work, then after that, they will have much better lives. And Napoleon says, no, no, we don't need to do that. We need to focus just on getting more food now, growing more food now. This windmill is a bad idea. So then they have this big, you know, vote for Snowball, vote for Napoleon, vote for Snowball, vote for Napoleon. And they have these kind of like a, like a political campaign, right? Both of them trying to be to win. They also, you know, they, they also disagree about um, fighting. Basically, they're afraid that the humans will come back and attack again. So they also have different plans. Snowball Napoleon 
what to do. So Napoleon says they need to get guns and learn how to shoot guns. That's Napoleon's plan. Snowball's plan is to create more revolutions on other farms. If they create more revolutions, then the humans can't attack them because they'll have to deal with their own revolutions. So again, they, they argue and argue and argue. And then this is kind of funny. This is a little of the dark humor, the black humor, we call it, of Orwell. And he says that the animals can't decide, right? He says, the animals agree with whoever was speaking at the moment. So basically the animals are too stupid and they're not independent. They don't think deeply. They don't think independently. They don't make their own decisions. So they just try to follow Snowball or Napoleon. And when, when Snowball's speaking, ah, they get excited about Snowball and they believe what Snowball's saying. Ah, yes, yes. But then Napoleon speaks and then they go, oh, yes, yes, yes. And then they believe Napoleon. And then Snowball speaks again, ah, and they believe Snowball. So they're not really thinking themselves. They don't, they can't find their own way. They can't make their own decisions. They're just, looking up to the two leaders, and they just go from one to the other, one to the other, one to the other. And this is kind of, uh, you know, one of Orwell's criticisms, I think, of, of most people, of what we, um, the general population. Most people are too stupid or too obedient. They don't think deeply enough, and so they just follow whoever seems to be the leader at that time. And, you know, sadly, he's correct. Okay, what happens next? This is the bad part. The evil really begins now. They finally decide to have a big meeting to discuss the snow, the, the windmill and to have a vote. The, so the final meeting to decide will yes for Snowball and yes build the windmill or yes for Napoleon and do not build the windmill. So Snowball gets up and he gives a great speech about electricity and, and hot and cold water and an electric heater and all, all the great things that will come from the windmill. And Napoleon doesn't say much. He just stands up for a few seconds like he doesn't care and says, no, it's a bad idea. And then he sits down again. And then Snowball gives a great, great, great speech and everybody, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Snowball's winning. Everybody is going to vote for Snowball because Napoleon doesn't, hardly, doesn't say much. But just when everybody is ready to vote for Snowball, what happens? Well, Napoleon gives a little, like, makes a sound, kind of, I don't know, but it just has a high-pitched sound. So he kind of, he just kind of calls out, makes a strange sound. And when he does, what happens? Nine enormous dogs. Enormous means huge. Enormous means very, very, very big. Nine huge, enormous, very big dogs wearing thick collars with brass, with metal on them, come bounding into the barn, kind of jumping and running into the barn. And they run towards Snowball ah, with their teeth ah, open. And Snowball jumps just in time as they, the snapping jaws, they try to bite him. And then Snowball has to run. He runs as fast as he can. And these nine killer dogs chase him and chase him. And they almost get him one time. And they bite him and they almost get him another time. And finally, Snowball just barely escapes. He goes through a hole in the hedge, you know, the bushes. And, and he escapes. And it says he was seen no more. They never see Snowball again. And all the animals are shocked and terrified. They're scared. Oh, what just happened? And the dogs come running back in. And of course, where did these dogs come from? They were confused, but then they finally realized these were the puppies that Napoleon took, remember? He took the puppies away from their moms, away from their families, and he privately taught them, educated them, and raised them. 
Well, now they're his own, like, his own little army, his own little secret police, right? They stay close to Napoleon at all times. They're loyal to him only. So, he, Napoleon seizes power with these dogs. And then he gets up and he, decide, he says, no more meetings on Sundays. We don't need meetings anymore. No more voting. We're not going to vote anymore. There is no longer necessary. He says, all decisions will now happen from, will all come from the pigs. We'll have a, the pigs only will have a meeting. They will just make the decisions and then tell the other animals what to do. And of course, Napoleon will be the leader of the meeting of the pigs. He says, there will be no more debates, no more discussions. All the decisions will be made by Napoleon and the other pigs. And it says all the other animals, they're a bit shocked by this. They don't really understand what's happening. Boxer, the great hero, the horse that really cares about everybody. He's also kind of troubled. He's, oh, he's not sure. What does this mean? I don't know. Now, for young Pigs, then again, the pigs are the most clever, the smartest. Four young pigs do realize what's happening, and they start to disagree. They start to speak up. This is bad. This is not good. But then the dogs go, Rrr. the dogs growl at them, and they get scared, and they shut up. And then, while everybody is kind of shocked, all the sheep, Napoleon kind of looks at the sheep, and the sheep all start chanting again. Four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad. This kind of mindless slogan again and again and again and again to distract everybody, right? Get them to start thinking, stop thinking about what happened, and just say this again and again and again. Then Squealer, Squealer's kind of like... Uh, Napoleon's assistant, right? He's the clever speaker. He says, oh, comrades, you know, friends, don't worry, don't worry. Um, Napoleon still believes that all animals are equal, but he's doing this to help you. He's like, Napoleon wants you to make your own decisions. He, would, he wants you to make your own decisions, but the problem is, sometimes you make the wrong decisions. Sometimes you decide wrong, and then what happens? Then everyone will suffer. And so, Napoleon needs to make the decisions for you. And then he says, this is again another point we'll talk about, he says, Snowball was just a criminal. Snowball was a criminal. And then somebody says, but whoa, wait, wait, Snowball, he was a brave fighter, right? In the battle in chapter four, Snowball was a brave fighter. And then Squealer says, bravery is not enough. Loyalty and obedience are most important. Hmm, interesting. And then he brings up the outside enemy again. Remember, Mr. Jones? We have to have discipline. We must be disciplined. We must be loyal and obedient or Mr. Jones will come back. The enemy, the human will come back. You don't want him to come back. So fear, fear, fear of Mr. Jones. And they all, oh yeah, right. Uh, oh. And then Boxer, you know, remember Boxer has a good heart, but he's not very, not smart. So Boxer suddenly decides, oh, if, if Napoleon says something is right, it must be right. So he just starts to repeat, Napoleon is always right. Napoleon is always right. So Boxer just becomes loyal to Napoleon. He doesn't want to think about all this stuff too much. So he just decides Napoleon is always right. The leader, the great leader is always right. Then and that's maybe some more black humor here. They, remember Major? Chapter one, the old major, he was kind of like Karl Marx. He's the, he was the guy that talked about the idea of Animal Farm, the pig, but, uh, but he died before the revolution. Well, they find his skull, his head, and they, they dig it up <laughs> after, from where it was buried, and they put it next to the flag. So they can all kind of worship the, the skull, the bone, the head bone of old major. 
Then, even stranger, a few weeks later, Napoleon announces that yes, we are going to build the windmill. And all the other, and now the animals are very confused. They thought he was against it. Now he says, we will do it. But remember, he looked, he kind of stole the plans from Snowball. Or he tried to. He tried to, he looked at Snowball's plans and tried to memorize them. And so all the animals are confused, but then Squealer says, ah, so more kind of flies, right? Actually, Napoleon always wanted the windmill. He was only pretending. And in fact, Snowball stole the plans from Napoleon. Snowball was a criminal. He's a bad guy, a bad pig. And he stole the windmill plans. It was actually Napoleon who created the plans for the windmill. And the animals are kind of confused, but Squealer's a good speaker, and plus there are the dogs are there kind of uh, scaring everybody. So they all just, oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Oh, Napoleon's very smart. Oh, and they just decide to pretend to believe everything Napoleon says. And that is the end of chapter five. And as we can see now, Napoleon now has total power. So now this is a dictatorship. One, one pig as the complete total top leader. And then, you know, with some of his pig advisors and, of course, his trained dogs. who He got his puppies and they're now big and, and he has power. He's power from force, right? He has the power of these dogs. If any, anyone disagrees with him or fights against him and the dogs will kill them. So let's go and talk about the meaning now. So again, we'll start with the, the obvious historical, what Orwell's talking about, the history of the Soviet Union and what happened, the, what he felt like was the betrayal of the Russian people. And so, of course, Napoleon is Stalin. So Stalin didn't really care about, you know, great theories and equality and the, helping the poor people. He just wanted power, total power. And Stalin seized power. He just took it with his secret police. And, of course, Stalin did exactly that. Anyone who went against Stalin got killed. Um, tens of millions of people murdered, starved, uh, put in prisons, the gulags, you know, all of that. A horror, horror. And not just Soviet Russia, but many other places that have had these kinds of revolutions. We've seen this, you know, Cambodia is a sad, sad example where Pol Pot took power and then just, you know, millions murdered. So, pretty horrible. Pretty horrible. This is, this is where it leads. <laughs> so, it's quite, quite horrible. So let's go back. So we have Molly first. Let's go back a little lighter. The chapter starts with Molly. So Molly, you know, remember back when they had the, the Berlin Wall, right? There was the wall going in the middle of Berlin. People used to try to run away from East Germany, try to escape from Soviet Union or East Germany, right? They would defect. It's called defecting, right? To, to leave, to escape. That's, they had to build the wall to prevent people from leaving. Because once the reality, once people started to realize the reality, and that, for example, in East Germany, the situation, the life was much more terrible than in West Germany. So, of course, people started wanting to leave East Germany and go to the West. So they had to build a big wall to stop them. And this is why this already starts with Mali. So even though things are not so terrible, in the beginning of chapter five, Molly Molly wants to be free. She she doesn't care about all this revolution stuff, doesn't care about all this equality. She just wants to enjoy her life. She wants to have nice food and enjoy looking pretty. And when they find out she's talking to someone else, Clover, see you know discovers that she's uh, talking to outsiders. Molly gets scared. And she escapes. She leaves, and she goes to another farm. So it's kind of like the, the people who 
escaped from East Germany or, you know, the, all these refugees, say, from Cambodia, you know, from the killing fields who, who had to escape into Vietnam and into Thailand. Um, you know, we've seen it in many places. Right now it's happening in Venezuela. We're starting, starting to get reports, starting to hear of lots and lots of Venezuelans trying to escape to Colombia. All right, so then we get the hard winter, and the, really the center of this chapter is about Napoleon and Snowball. So Snowball is the idealist, right? He's the intellectual, the idealist. Most people believe this, that uh, Snowball represents Trotsky in the Soviet uh, Revolution. You know, the intellectual, the idealist. And he, he has all these plans, and he really wants, has the idea that they're going to make this utopia, this perfect society. He really believes it. Whereas Napoleon clearly is just waiting and planning for power. For Napoleon, this whole revolution means nothing. He doesn't believe equality. He doesn't believe any of the stuff that, that they're saying. He's just tr looking for the way to get power. Right? He's using the revolution to get power. So he, he pretends to believe this stuff, but he really doesn't, as we see. So there's a power struggle. And again, this happens a lot. Power struggles, right? Any revolution, any politics, any country will see power struggles at the top. And the more the power is concentrated, right, the more you have a lot of power at the top with just a few people. Well, then those few people will start to fight each other because they want more power. They want total power. And this is what happens between Napoleon and Snowball. We also see, Orwell shows us who wins, who wins these power struggles. Not the idealist, not the person who, oh, I want to help everybody. That's not who wins these power struggles. Who wins the power struggles? The terrible, evil guys, people, pigs in this story, who are willing to use power to kill people, power to scare people. That's who wins. Finally, who wins these power struggles? That's who wins. That's why we get these terrible dictators in all these different countries. That's why we get these, you know, horrible, horrible people who kill millions and millions. Because that's the kind of person who will gain total power. That's the kind of person who will win in the end. Unless you have a system that limits power somehow, that divides it up enough where you can't get just one or a few people with all of it. But that's not easy. Because these kind of people, like Napoleon, the pig, um, they exist. And they are, they are willing to murder. They're willing to lie. They're willing to do anything to get that power. They're willing to pretend. Now, I mentioned this uh, before. I just want to go back to it because it's a tactic I see happening a lot right now in the United States where the, they're having the meetings and Napoleon has the sheep, he tells the sheep to go into the meetings and when Snowball tries to speak, the sheep just start saying, four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad, just to interrupt the speech, to try to silence the opposition, to try to silence speech. Silence free speech. That's what he's doing. And this tactic is used very commonly now. I'll switch over here. This tactic is used a lot. I see it happening on in American colleges and universities all the time. You have it's pretty much used by just let what are called left-wing. I don't know what you can call them, socialist, communist, I don't know, feminist, whatever. They have used different names. But this tactic they constantly use now where they're trying to use this for censorship. So it's exactly, it's, it's been around a long time, obviously, because Orwell wrote about it. This tactic of trying to interrupt free speech, to use censorship. It's called, you know, it's like called the, uh, what's it called? What is it called? Not the Hector's veto. Um... Anyway, it's, it's a tactic where you just kind of yell and interrupt and, and use this 
to silence speakers you don't like. And this is happening in American universities and all over America. This is happening where anytime a kind of center or conservative speaker tries to speak, they get interrupted by these uh, left-wing socialist feminist groups and they just shout and shout and shout. They pull the fire alarm sometimes. They just do anything they can to silence free speech. It's anti-free speech. So this is one of, again, it's a warning sign of what's happening in Animal Farm. When you have a group that starts using these tactics to silence people, it's a big danger sign. Which is why I'm quite worried about the United States, honestly. And Europe. You, the UK is even worse. Okay, uh, another comment about, you know, Orwell mentions how while Snowball, the idealist, has lots of ideas, he's always got plans and ideas, so he's a really a true believer, Snowball. Whether he's good or not, I don't know. That's a different question. But he certainly believes. He believes in these ideas. He, he really does believe in them. And uh, so he has all these plans. But Napoleon and kind of the type of if we're talking about the real world, the type of people that fall of, of this kind, they're just blindly obedient. They're just sort of mindless, right? And they're very negative. They just attack. They just hate everybody else. They don't really have much plans. They, they have a few things, slogans they say, like equality, equality, and the patriarchy's evil, or whatever. White men are all evil, or whatever. But they don't really have many plans for anything positive. They don't usually do much that's positive. They don't really help anybody or do anything helpful. They just attack, 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 attack. And that's what Napoleon does. So this is another comment by Orwell and that he's really showing, again, another danger sign. If you see a group like this and they're just attacking and they're not really doing anything positive, they're never building anything, right? They just want to destroy the society, but not they never they're never building anything themselves. Again, these these are evil people that just want power. They just want power. Anything else they say that is just lies. Now I think that um, this windmill thing is kind of uh, Orwell's a little bit of humor again, a little dark humor where he's sort of. Uh, making fun of or joking about uh, what what happened in the Soviet Union. So in the Soviet Union, they would have these big five-year plans, these great plans for building the perfect society, the workers' paradise, right? And they were going to industrialize and make all these great factories and these super advanced farms, and they had all these plans, and they completely they tried to completely change up everything in the society and get rid of. Uh, eliminate all of the tradition, do everything new and different. And most of them were disasters, huge disasters that caused starvation, that uh, they were big failures, most of them. Which is why the Soviet Union eventually, after a long time, got financially collapsed. And why the Soviet Union did not do as well as the United States did or the West did or possibly even why the, so the Russia is now doing much better. Russia is actually uh, becoming quite advanced with their technology and uh, doing quite well with their economy now that they've got a different type of system. So this is a little bit of Orwell's, you know, I think, uh, a little criticism and kind of joke about what happened. And we've seen the same thing, what's happening in Venezuela now. Uh, I don't know. You know, a, a, they used to have a decent, you know, economy, and now it's completely falling apart. So all of their their crazy plans of you know, destroying their traditional economy has now produced a disaster, <laughs> where the whole thing is falling apart. And so it's a little bit of uh, a comment also about you have to be careful. You know that that again, these groups they just want to destroy, destroy, and tear apart. And the problem is they tear apart systems that are very, very old. I'll give you another example. In Cambodia, they, 
they actually tried to destroy families, right? They break apart families. And they tried to turn the children, make the children uh, go against their own parents. Terrible, right? And they thought, oh, we'll do this and the, the children will instead be loyal to the, the Communist Party, the state, the government. And it was a massive disaster, right? Because the family is the core of human society. It has been for tens of thousands of years. So if you tried to destroy something that old and replace it, most likely what you try will not work. Most likely what you try will be a huge failure, right? Because this system has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years because it works. And so this is why we must be very careful, and not only in this kind of revolution, but I think in general, that we worship the new too much. We get too, we're too fast to try to destroy old things and old systems. We think they're bad. We think, oh, they're, well, now we're more advanced. But we make big mistakes when we do this, because many times we get rid of something old, we don't understand it, we don't understand why it worked, and when we try to get rid of it, we create much worse problems. So it's a kind of a warning about this. All right. And then finally, the big thing that happens. Well, another commentary, again, is about where Orwell, the more black humor, he's really commenting on the stupidity, or at the very least, the shallowness of most people. That, and I think he's, he's, he's correct about this. I don't know if stupidity is the word, but um, he's basically commenting that most people in the story, most animals, they're just followers. Most people are followers. They're not leaders. Most people do not think deeply. Most people just they want someone to tell them what to do. They don't want to think too much. Most people are not ready for total freedom. This is what Orwell is more or less saying. Right? Because in the animals, except the pigs, the other animals are not ready. They're, they're not able to make clear decisions. They're not able to think deeply. Not able or they're too lazy and they don't want to. But either way, they don't, they, they just, they can only follow leaders. That's all they can do, most of these animals. And, you know, that's, I think maybe that's the root of the problem that Orwell is pointing out. Is the problem is that most of the animals don't think. They're not independent, they don't make their own decisions, and they can't. They just want someone to tell them what to do. So it was Mr. Jones, and then they replaced Mr. Jones with Snowball and Napoleon, and then finally with just Napoleon. And so this probably is the root of the problem. Because if you just wait around for leaders to tell you what to do, and you're, you're in a position of weakness, and it's easy for you to be used. And so what he's showing in this story is that just replacing one leader with a different leader, in the end, usually will not make things much better. Right? They, Mr. Jones was not bad, didn't treat them very well. They got rid of him. Oh, everything will be great now, but now, now they have Napoleon, who's going to be even worse. But this is sort of their own fault in a way, because from the beginning they got rid of Mr. Jones and immediately they let the pigs tell them what to do. Immediately they let the pigs become leaders, right? They couldn't be their own leaders. They couldn't make their own decisions. They couldn't do this. They, and, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just human nature that we are hierarchical animals, like wolves, right? And they're sort of a top wolf and a second wolf, and that most humans just are not leaders, and most humans just sort of naturally look up and want a leader to tell them what to do. But this is also a huge weakness, a huge weak point in our modern society, because it means that one or a few people 
get a lot of power and most of these leaders, the kind of people who become these leaders, they don't really care about us. They care about themselves. They want power. They want control. So just changing the leader probably is not going to change. Even though you think the next leader, the new leader, you think the new leader will be great. The new leader is going to be fine. The new leader says lots of good stuff. The new leader sounds so good. But guess what? The new leader becomes Napoleon. So I think this is, and this is something I see, right? There's that Who song that by the Who, it's an old song. Right? And there's a, that great famous line, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Meet the new boss, bow, 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 same as the old boss. Bow, 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 bow. You know it. <laughs> Won't get fooled again is the name of the song. And uh, it's the same point, right? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Honestly, I found this myself in just as, uh, not in government, but just in jobs. I realized I, had, I got my first job when I was 16 years old, I think, six, 15 or 16, fast food. And uh, I, I basically hated it. I hated my first job. It was, I was like, oh, this sucks. It's boring. I don't like it. And the boss was kind of, you know, not, not so nice. I didn't like Someone telling me what to do all the time and kind of yelling at me, not being so nice to me. And uh, I thought, oh, this sucks. I, I, I need a better job. I want a better job with, you know, a better boss. And then I went to school and then I got another job and another job. And then I, I get another job and say, like, oh, this job still sucks. And oh, I still, this boss is not so good. Maybe I'll get a, a different work and it'll be better. But after many, many, many years, and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, a lot of jobs, I finally realized the problem was bosses in general. The problem is I did not like having a boss, period. That just getting a new boss didn't change it a lot. Yeah, some bosses were a little better, some bosses were worse, but the overall problem was I was still under a boss all the time. And that's when I finally realized, oh, I need to start my own company. I need to be my own boss. This is the only solution. Otherwise, I will always be unhappy working. That's why I decided to start my own business and to start Effortless English. Right? The problem was the boss itself. And I think this is what we kind of see in Animal Farm, the message is. The problem is... Too much power, right? The, the problem is we all are always looking to s the big hero to save us. Oh, if we just get another hero, another leader to save us. The next president, the next leader, the next uh, dictator, whoever, doesn't matter, right? And it never, never, never works. And of course, what happens is in the beginning, we give power to these leaders, right, through voting or whatever. But then they just take it. Then they, once they have some power, they use that power to gain even more power. So what, you know, Napoleon sort of uses, at first he's very tricky and very careful. But then when the time is right, he just takes it with force. And how does he do it? This is, again, back to my point about education. Remember, by controlling education, right, he takes those puppies, those little baby dogs, away from the family, their families, and then he teaches them, he trains them to be loyal to him only. And he trains them up and he gives them the best food until they get big and strong and, uh, and scary. And then he uses them to take control completely. Because now he has his little small army. Now he has his little police force that only follow him. And this is what we see. This is why governments love education. This is why governments like to control schools. They want to control how the children think. Because if they do that, if they can get your children when they're young, they can fill their minds to be loyal to the government. Right? They can make your children into your enemy. Right? They can turn the children against their own parents, against their own tradition. 
They can use those children when they get older to gain total control. And this is what we're seeing in the United States with these children at universities and colleges that after all these years of government propaganda in schools, they're now turning against America, turning against their own families. It's scary. And they're becoming more and more violent, just like the dogs. So we've seen this. Uh, as I said, you know, it, it, even more terrible situations like uh, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, who really, <laughs> they, they, they murdered people. They took, they, they trained the children from a young age to spy on their own parents. Really horrible stuff. So it can, it can be really terrible. This is why I am against government schools. Really don't like them because you're giving too much power to the government and they will use it. All right, and then of course the dogs attack and get rid of Snowball. So this is the death of idealism, right? When Snowball is, when the dogs drive away Snowball, Snowball has to run away. All the idealism, all the great ideas of the revolution, the animal revolution, are now dead. It's over. It's all just power and force now. Napoleon just takes power. So from this point in the story, there's no more great ideas. There's no more, oh, everybody's equal and wonderful. They use, they'll say these things, but they're all lies now. Complete lies. Napoleon does not believe them at all. And even the animals will eventually start to realize they're not true, but they say them because of fear. So instead of idealism and ideas, now what we have is just fear. The animals are now afraid of Napoleon and the dogs. Napoleon, the pigs, and but mostly these dogs that can kill them. So it's force. Ultimately, it's the force of death, of imprisonment, that creates their power. And, indeed, this is what we see every single time in one of these types of revolutions. They always turn to power. They always turn to guns and prisons to make themselves more and more powerful. And then, you know, it's all over. There's no more idealism. It's just a dictatorship. Finally, we see what's called um, revisionism. Revising history, it means changing history. We saw this earlier already, they did this a little bit with the humans. But they do it again now with Snowball. And this is again, on one level, the Soviet Union did this a lot. They would suddenly, uh, like Trotsky, because of Stalin, Stalin got control, suddenly Trotsky became an enemy. Right? He, before he was the great, wonderful Trotsky as part of the Soviet Union. Yay, we love him! But then, when Stalin got control, and Trotsky had to escape, Suddenly, they changed all the history, and they said, oh, no, 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 Trotsky's evil, Trotsky's a criminal, Trotsky's bad. And, of course, they, they eventually assassinated Trotsky in Mexico. So they do the same with Snowball here, right? After Snowball's gone, they say, oh, no, actually, Snowball was not a hero, even though he was. No, no, he was a criminal. So they just start making lies about Snowball, that he was a criminal, that he stole the plans for the windmill from Napoleon. Napoleon uh, actually wanted the windmill, but Snowball was a bad pig and he stole them. So they, they start telling all these lies and they completely change the, um, the history, right? They, they create this fake history, this propaganda history. And again, this is what we see with, uh, well, I'd say this, we probably see this in almost every country. It's worse in the sort of socialist, communist, totalitarian systems where they really change everything. But, um, but, it, but truthfully, if we really look at history carefully, we'll see that every single country does this. They have their propaganda, and they only tell parts of history, and they rewrite history. So you have to be careful about history. I'm very, very careful about history. Anytime you're looking at history, you must be careful, especially if it's the history of your own country, because there's a lot of lies and propaganda in there, probably. American history taught in schools in America 
There are a lot of just straight lies. They just teach a lot of straight lies and propaganda. You know, all these offic the official history of all these things we learn, how much of it is really true? How much of it lies? Because what happens is the winners write the history. This is what we see. Napoleon won, so now Napoleon's going to write the history. And now, because Napoleon won, Snowball's an enemy. If Snowball won, Napoleon would be written as the enemy in history, and they would all learn after this that he was the enemy. So this is what we see. So World War II, how much of the history we learn is true? What do we not learn? All we know is that the Allies write the history because they won. What if the other side had won? What would we have learned? What would be the history officially? Hmm? I don't know. The American Revolution, what if the British had won? What would the history be? What would we learn? Right? The, then all those Americans that revolted, they would be enemies and criminals and horrible people. So, my point is, not that the American Revolution was evil, I actually I think it was quite a good thing, but uh, my point is we have to be careful with history, and especially when we are looking at more recent history and when we're looking at uh, these kind of political history because you can't trust the official version only. You have to look deeper because this happens everywhere, this rewriting of history. And finally, a little a last joke from Orwell when they get the skull, the head bone of Major, and they put it up by the flag. So this is quite similar to what, you know, they did this to Lenin in uh, the Soviet Union where they got his body and they filled it with chemicals and they put him there and, uh, and people would come by and look, they would look at him and kind of like, almost like worship him, right? So it's, it's just a little weird. And then finally, yeah, Napoleon says, we are going to build the windmill, because he, he looked at the plans. He looked at Snowball's plans. So now he says, oh, it was actually my idea. They tell this huge, big lie. And Napoleon decides, yeah, actually, I am going to build the windmill. I, it's my plan. Some more lies, and we'll see this turns into quite a disaster, actually. So, there you go. So the revolution, the ideals, the, 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 the big, wonderful ideas of the re revolution are now dead. It's now just total power and control. And as we're going to see, it will now get worse and worse and worse very quickly. Once this total power happens, everything becomes bad very fast. This is what we've also seen another warning, is that, you know, for a while when there's a power struggle, when, there's, when it's the beginning of the revolution, you know, everybody's kind of pretending, and a lot, like the, the Napoleons, the Stalins, are pretending they're saying what all the right stuff but they're all in the background secretly trying to get that power and once one of them wins then they get total control and that's when they start shooting and killing people Pol Pot in Cambodia you know they they killed people just because they had glasses they decided all intellectuals all smart people must be killed because they are enemies of the revolution we all, we all we do see that also that sometimes they eliminate people who they think are too smart because they will be possible uh, rivals. They might challenge their power. And the problem happens is that then all the smart people, all the productive people, they either get killed or they leave. They run away. And so what's left in these societies is just are less intelligent, less productive people. So the whole thing kind of drops down, right? They, they're, they're not as effective. Like the animals got rid of Snowball. Snowball had a lot of good plans. He was quite smart. But now they got rid of, Napoleon got rid of him. So Napoleon is not as smart. He's more mean. He's more uh, clever in a way, right? For getting power. He's stronger. But he's not as smart as Snowball. And so maybe Snowball Maybe he could have built the windmill. Maybe it would have been successful because he was clever and smart. But he's gone now. Napoleon chased him away. And so there's no one left who's quite as good. And so this is what we, we see a lot in the society like Venezuela. I'm sure anybody who's uh, 
productive and intelligent and has some money is trying to get out of there now. Trying to escape. So they're, they're all the, the bright, the smartest and the most productive people and the people who have successful businesses, they're all trying to run away. So what, what's left? The, the whole economy collapses then. Right? This is what happened when the Cambodians, they kill all the smart people, or they kill a lot of them, and terrify the rest. So what do they do? The one, any that could, would, they escaped, they ran away as fast as they could, lots of them were murdered, and then what happened again? Their whole society collapsed. Pretty sad. Pretty horrible. Just horrible. Ugh. Terrible. When you look at the actual history, in country after country, what happens with these totalitarian Utopia. Remember, utopia is like the paradise on earth. Utopia revolutions. This kind of thing happens. So, be very, very careful of any kind of utopian idea. Much better, I think, are plans or, or leaders that are more realistic, that talk about you know, realistic plans and, and talk about having limitations and things like that. And then, of course, the other message being that in general, that relying on leaders is a bad idea. Because what are you doing when you rely on a leader? You're relying on another person, a stranger who does not know you, who does not really care about you, does not know you, does not know your family, and you're, you're saying, oh, this person will save me, this person will help me. They won't. Why would they? Why would they? They don't care about you. They don't care about your family. They just don't. They care about themselves. They care about their own families. That's about it. And most of these people, to get that high into government, they care about controlling, 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 power, control, and tons and tons of money. That's what they want. But even more than money, they want control and power. So you have to be careful, right? This is the problem. This is why I think, you know, making governments as small as possible is best. Limiting power is the only thing that seems to work. It doesn't work perfectly because these people are always trying to gain more and more power. So we always have to be trying to limit their power. It's a constant struggle. But if we just give them power, then that's when all the terrible stuff happens. I think it was... Thomas Jefferson, I can't remember which one of the American revolutionaries, but basically says the, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. The price to be free, for you to be free, is eternal, means forever. Vigilance, vigilance means watching carefully, watching carefully. So what he meant was that to be free, the people must always be carefully watching the government. The people in the government. Always watching them carefully. Never trusting them. Always looking for them to be cheating. Always looking for them. Trying to get more power. And uh, he was absolutely right. But unfortunately, people are distracted. People have their own lives. People get lazy. Well, a lot of people are just lazy. A lot of people are just stupid. A lot of people don't care. And even people who do care, uh, it's too complicated or too difficult or there are not enough of them. And so, little by little, these people get more and more and more power. The governments get bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more and more control. And nowadays, also, you know, certain corporations, uh, technology companies, Facebook, we're seeing now in the news, are gaining this massive control, this huge, big amount of control also. I don't know. So I'm not, I don't have like the magic answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can see the problem. I think Orwell's very right, correct about the problem. I, get, I, have, I have some individual ideas of what we must do, trusting ourselves and being as independent as we can. Uh, independent meaning taking self-reliant, relying on ourselves, taking care of ourselves and our families and trusting people we know face to face, people we really know. You know, it's, it's kind of uh, breaking the power up. More power at the local level, not at the far away top level. These are good ideas. How do we make them happen? I don't know. If I knew, maybe I would try to be the leader, but then you shouldn't trust me if I did that. So, 
Let's go to Facebook comments and questions. See some live comments and questions. Hmm. Okay. Hello, you're inspiring me a lot. Oh, well, thank you. I don't know if, I'm not sure if I'm inspired. When I read Animal Farm, I don't, um... I mean, it's funny. I, 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 it's kind of mixed emotions for me, reading this book. Uh, on one hand, it's funny. He uses animals. Uh, he does have some dark humor. The criticism of, you know, of these, uh events is so clear. I mean, I see it in what happens in America now. I see it in history. So there's kind of a humor. But on, on the other hand, I feel a little depressed because I see it still happening. People still believe all this stuff. Even after all these disasters, all these murders, all this horrible stuff. And yet it keeps happening again and again. Because like Orwell says, people look for leaders. People just believe these ideas it, they don't look at history. Most people don't think deeply about it. The ideas sound good and, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Everybody's equal. Yay! And then they just follow these people who just want power, and then the same thing happens again. So it's sort of a comedy and a tragedy. <laughs> uh, Animal Farm is a comedy and a tragedy, and human history is also a comedy and a tragedy that just keeps repeating itself. Again and again. At least modern, you know. The more modern, I guess, the 20th century is really when all this started. So, be careful of utopia. Be careful of this idea of paradise, the perfect society. Be careful of people who promise it. That's what I would say. Okay, let's go back to Facebook for some questions. Okay, Napoleon fed the young, hungry pup minds of the puppies with terrible lies. Scary. Yes. Absolutely frightening. This is why I support homeschooling. Some people, you may know, maybe you don't know, but I'm a big, big fan of homeschooling. It's teaching your own children at home. Now, I realize it's not for everybody. I don't believe in forcing people to do anything. Certainly not with education. So... It's not the only choice, but I believe it's the best choice for a lot of families. And the reason I like it I, is that, uh, number one, it's, it's called decentralized, right? No one, there's not one power for homeschooling. And every family makes their own decision. Some families might make bad decisions. Some will be great. Some, most will be in the middle. But the, the key point is that Nobody totally controls it. You're breaking up the power of education. You're breaking it up into millions and millions of families so that one group, one person can't control it. And that is much more safe. Now, the other reason I like homeschooling is it's more effective. It actually works better. If you look at the test scores, the performance of homeschooled children, they do much better. They just learn better. Well, it makes... It's, it's very logical why. Let's say if I have two children and I teach them in my home, or my wife teaches them at home, well, that's one adult for two children. That's a lot of individual attention for teaching. Now, in a school, you have one adult teacher for 30 kids, maybe 20 if you're lucky, maybe 40 in a large classroom. That's almost zero individual attention. It's so the quality in a large school classroom in a school is much 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 lower. The education quality is lower just because of numbers only. Now also when a government is teaching in these schools, well if it's a very nice good government, I don't know like uh, I don't know I can't are there any good ones? I don't know. Are there any good ones? I'm not sure if there are. Let's say a less bad one, like maybe Switzerland. I don't know. Swiss Switzerland. I don't know anything about Switzerland, but it seems like it has a nice, decent society. So let's say Switzerland, a kind of a not too bad government. Well, then maybe the education's not too bad, but still it's one group controlling it. So everyone's getting the exact same thing. So for quality, it's not so good. 
there's no innovation happening because it's all just one group making the decisions for every child. And uh, it's also just less effective again. So, now other things, I think a mix of schools, school choices. Some people, both parents have to work. So yes, there are other options. But I think there should be lots of options. But dividing it up and having lots of choices and lots of the power is divided up a lot. That's the best way that I see for education to prevent what happened with Napoleon. Right? Because this is, this is why when you always pe pe hear people talking about the children, the children, education so important. Most people who say that don't trust them. Don't trust them because they want to get control of your children's minds. Because children are easy to convince. It's, they don't know anything, okay? I'm sorry kids, but you're kind of stupid, okay? You're stupid when you're young. You're stupid when you're young, and this includes college students when they're, you know, like 20 years old. You think you're smart, you think you know a lot, but you're not. You're kind of stupid. All you have is book learning that somebody else told you. How do you know if it's true? You don't. You don't really know if it's true. And hey, I was the same, you know, I was 20 years old, I thought I was so smart. I wasn't. But this is why, you know, these people in power, they love, love, love to get to the kids. If they get to them really young, they can tell them anything. They can teach them anything and they'll believe it. They can teach them lies and lies and lies and they will believe it. So be very, very careful about education. Education is important, but this is, but it's important that you do it. As a, I think parents are the best people to do it. So be careful. You know, make sure your children are learn. Make sure you know what they're learning if you send them to a school. Make sure you look at what they're learning. Look at their books. Look at their textbooks. Ask them questions about what they're learning. Ask them what their teacher is teaching them. Be very, 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 very careful. And if you start hearing things that you don't like, consider a change. Change at schools or try homeschooling or do something else. But yes, it is very, very, very scary. Um, I agree. It's one of the frightening parts. For me, one of the most scary parts of Animal Farm is how Napoleon takes those puppies and then uses them through education to take total power and control. Kind of scary. All right. Yes, with AJ, we're learning history, politics, and English at the same time, says Diego. Exactly. That's sort of my effortless English philosophy, is I like to combine. Just English is kind of boring, right? For me, it's boring. Maybe my native language, but just learning vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation. Only that is kind of boring. We need ideas. Languages are for ideas. So learning the language plus some ideas is much more interesting. More, for, uh, more interesting for me, and I hope also more interesting for you. <laughs> All right. I think we lost our freedom at school, yes, indeed. When we waited, the, what the teacher will say, what we need to do. And then, um, this is Ale Alexander, uh, and mentions the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. We find de three levels, dependence, Independence and interdependence. Yes, indeed. Good point. So in schools, right, we're taught dependence, right? Dependence. Be dependent. It means you're in the position of the child. Uh, and the, the teacher is in power and you do what they said. Obedience, right? When what they want to train you, they want to train you to do this even as an adult. They want to keep you as a child forever in some ways, right? You're like forever the child. Where you're always obedient to the leader, to the person at top. That's a lot of what schools train you to do. Because the actual content of just learning the basic stuff of school, does you don't need that much time. You don't need six hours a day or seven hours a day. But most of what it is is training you to be obedient. Which is dependence. Exactly. Dependence. You're in a weak position. You're weak. Independence, the next stage, is where you are strong. This is true equality, where true equality of power, where you can take care of yourself. 
right? You don't need someone else to take care of you. You're now an adult. You take care of yourself. You get your own food. You get your own shelter. You make your own decisions. That's independence. And then the final stage mentioned here, interdependence, means connection. This is where, as an independent person, you start to work with other people. They help you. You help them. Right? You trade. You help each other. You make a family, right? A family is interdependent. You've got the two parents who are independent adults and the children. Everybody's helping everybody. That's called interdependence. But it requires independence first. You first got to be a strong adult making your own decisions, and then you can work with other strong adults. And this creates the healthiest groups. Good point. I agree. So I think, you know, see, part of, I think part of what we see with Animal Farm, with modern history, is a problem of scale, of size. And that, you know, perhaps human societies are too large. Maybe this is one of the problems, right? Because at a small level, at like a family or a small town level, it does seem possible to have a good community without one person gaining total power and people cooperating and helping each other and having good relations. That does seem possible at, at smaller levels in s small human groups. Uh, fam large families, tribes, what we used to call tribes, or like several families all connected to each other, small towns or villages. But then as, thing, as these human groups get larger, towns and then big cities and then large countries, nations with millions of people, then what you see is it's hard for to control all those people. So then the people at the top start using all these terrible methods to try to control these large, large groups of people. And with these large groups of people, they don't know each other. So people don't trust each other so much. This is when these leaders start to gain huge amounts of power. So this could also be part of the problem is that, you know, maybe our countries and our communities are too big. I don't know. I do, I, like you look at a country like Switzerland, for example, not Switzerland is not perfect, but, but it does seem to be a fairly peaceful country with a very long, peaceful history. Uh, with, it seems like a fairly happy society, but it's small, it's little, and of course it's surrounded by mountains, so it can't, not so easy to be attacked. So they have that, they have the safety of not being attacked, and they're kind of, they're small, so it's a smaller country, this is easier to manage. I don't know, but it's one idea, one factor maybe, possibly. As it says, good to see Brazilians on the commentaries. I have complete, I'm have i completely sure Brazilians are loving English. Yes, good. <laughs> I'm glad to see Brazilians too. I have not been to Brazil. I have my, my one connection to Brazil is I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So uh, I have, some, I have a Brazilian, a couple, some Brazilian instructors uh, at my gym here in Japan learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So hello to all the Brazilians out there. Brazil gave us Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and the and Elio Gracie and Carlos Gracie and all the great Brazil you know uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu masters. So for that alone, I am thankful to Brazil. Thank you. All right, a few more comments and then we're gonna go. Mm -hmm, let's see. Oh, this is a really good point that Marcin, I'm sorry to pronounce your name, but really interesting. Uh, but it's a great point. Today we have to face up, means we have to face, we have to understand, the next very powerful technique of manipulation, of propaganda, which is celebrities, especially musicians and actors. Yes, good point. Now this is something more new. Orwell doesn't really... Uh, focus on this because it it's, it really is more new uh, technique. Especially musicians and actors have a strong influence on people and they push these terrible ideas, agendas. We see it clearly in Hollywood where people get crazy seeing their favorite celebrities. 
Their fans worship them and would do anything for them. Absolutely. Good point. Very good point. Um, yes, yeah, like the in America, you know, you got the Kardashians or sort of the famous example, one famous example. But this is a good point. This is, again, the power of media, all right, of television and, uh, and web, but especially video, really, the power of video especially, to create these celebrities. So, again, where we're um, actors, for example, where we see them in these movies and they're these strong heroes, rah, 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 and then we think, oh, this is who they really are. But they're not. They're natural liars. I mean, an actor is a liar. That's what they do. They're professional liars, in a way, right? They're professional pretenders. They pretend to be someone else. So, of course, they're very good at lying. Actors are excellent at lying. That's their whole job, is to pretend to be different, to show fake emotions, right? And yet, people believe it. And they get millions of people crazy about, oh, I love you, I love you. And anything they say, they, they believe them. And now we're seeing these celebrities are being used for politics to push certain political ideas. So it's, again, it's Orwell's comment, kind of, right, about how people are always looking for a leader. They're always looking for someone to, to be their hero. They're always looking for someone to follow. Oh, 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 who's above them. This seems some kind of natural part of human nature. I think it is. I think it's biological, even. But the problem is now with the technology we have, that this bi biology is being uh, manipulated, right? They're using our biology against us. So maybe, in a, in, again, in very small groups, maybe small family groups and tribes, traditional groups, this looking for a leader is maybe not so bad, right? If, if, let's say, a small hunting group, you know, we go back 10,000 years, 20,000 years. So some just small group uh, and they're, it's like a large extended family or a tribe. And they're all hunting and cooperating. So yeah, maybe, maybe they did need to have some leaders, right? They needed maybe the best hunter. He needed to be the leader of the hunters. And maybe they needed somebody who was very wise and old to help them make decisions and they naturally looked up to that person and at the small level maybe that was fine especially they had family connections they knew each other they were friends they were family they really cared about each other because of that so that probably worked for us it probably worked for most of our history but now we have these gigantic societies with millions and millions and millions billions of people and Somehow we still do this, right? But now they can use video and TV to make these, pretend these fake heroes, right? So that these people pretending to be wonderful people and we just naturally have some kind of psychological or, or biology, or naturally we, oh, they're great. And we have this idea to, oh, follow them. And of course, this is used against us. It's used against us because it's, they are not our friends. They're not our family. They don't love us. They don't care about us. They're usually lying to us. So it's very dangerous. So I agree. That's a good point. We must be careful. Just because someone is a good musician does not mean they're a good person. In fact, if you look, if you read the books about musicians, if you read their stories, their biographies, most of them, most of them are drug addicts, right? Drug addicts, alcoholics. They're not good people. You don't want their advice for life. Now, they still have great music, like I like Led Zeppelin. I love their music. Jimmy Page, great guitar player. Really great guitar player. So, I, I, as a guitar player, I respect Jimmy Page. I love Jimmy Page's uh, ability. But, on the other hand, uh, he was a heroin addict. <laughs> he was a drug addict. <laughs> Not now, but he was a drug addict. So I don't want life advice from him. Okay? He does not have good life advice for me or for you. No. Luckily, he's not very political, but some of them are. Many actors are very political now. But if you look at their private lives, these people are messed up. They have, they're not good people. They really have a huge number of problems. Many are not very smart. There's no reason, just because someone's an actor, there's no reason to admire them or trust them. You can like their movies, but 
but in other parts of life, they're usually not very good people, actually. They're, they're not worth respecting. All right, good points. Okay, on to the good comment. I heard that Stalin once killed his own people to replace them with others because he was afraid of betrayal. It's sad these kind of people are stronger mentally than the good ones. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, well, this is why we don't want them to gain that level of power, right? So Stalin was fine when he was not totally in power. He, he didn't have the power to do all of that. So the problem is people didn't see it. Right? Once they have the power, with Napoleon, right? once he had the dogs, they should have stopped him when he took the puppies. The, you know, to use the, the story as an example, uh, if the animals had said, why are you taking these puppies? They're not yours. Right? If the dogs, the adult dogs, the moms and the dads of the dog, puppies, if they had said, no, you cannot have our puppies, and took them, took them back and fought against Napoleon at that time, Eh, probably Napoleon would have lost. He didn't have the power then. But they, they trusted him too much. See, they use lies in the beginning and then power later. They, they start with lies, 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 and then and tricks. Because they don't yet have the power. This is why you must stop them when they are in the early part, before they get the power. After they have the power, it's too late. This is why I'm speaking up now myself, this little bit I'm trying to do on YouTube, because they're using lies and censorship now. YouTube is trying to uh, control and silence lots and lots of people um, on the college, universities, and campuses in the United States. They're trying to silence pe speakers. They're doing it in the news. So. Now is the time to speak. Now is the time to fight them. Because if they get power, well, it's going to be too late. It will be too late. They will have the military. They will have the police. And then the killing starts. That's the sad part. Then people go to prison. Then people get killed. You must stop it. In Venezuela, they should have stopped it before they got power. But now it's too late. Now it's too late. That's the sad part. But this is why we have to think, and this is why Orwell's criticism about the animals being stupid and just believing and just following, that's you know his main criticism. That's how Napoleon got power. That's how the pigs got. Even before Napoleon, the pigs had power. So Snowball was not great because they said equality, equality, and then immediately the pigs became the leaders and got, and got the power and started taking the best food. That's when they should have immediately said, oh, you're lying, wait, they could have stopped them then. But now it's too much too late. So you must think. You must not trust too much. Don't trust the media. Don't trust television. I don't trust the news at all. Anything I, anything I see on television, I do not trust it. I, in fact, the opposite. If I watch any, like CNN, it doesn't matter which one, all of them. If I see something on the TV, news, I immediately think it's not totally true and they're lying somehow. That's my first thought. Now, maybe sometimes it's true, but I, my first thought is they're probably lying because they usually are. So you have to, our, our biggest problem is we trust these leaders too much. We trust the celebrities. Oh, but they're so beautiful. They look so nice. And they, they, they pretend to be such great heroes. And people trust them. Or the politicians that you like. You know, your group. You think, oh, they're so nice. Oh, and we trust them too much. So seeing through the lies. And then when you see a lie, say it. Speak up. Speak up. Tell the truth. Jordan Peterson talks about this. Tell the truth. That's our first and best way to fight back. Because we can stop it before violence. Napoleon, once he has power, only fighting and violence will, will work. And then, it's, and then he has more power now. The other animals, if they fight him, then they're going to have a huge bloody battle. Lots of them will die, and they might still lose because he has those big dogs now. But if they just start fought him with truth in the beginning, probably they could have 
one. They could have prevented him from getting power. So I think that's the one of the big messages I see from this is you got to it's, it's the beginning is when you when you see this happening, when you see the lies and the propaganda happening, you've got to speak up and tell the truth in person face to face. If someone's saying lies, you got to say, "Hey, you're wrong. Wrong. I disagree. That's wrong." You do it online, you do it on the telephone, you do it with family, you do it with friends, you do it at work, anything like that. I mean, like this whole thing, a small example, is like this whole thing of there are more than two genders. There's man and woman, and there's lots of other ones. And that a man pretending to be a woman, we have to call him a woman and say, oh yeah, he's really a woman. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. And how do you fight? We can't accept. If you accept that lie, and you let them scare you, because they're going to scream and yell and protest if you disagree with them, well, then they move to the next lie and the next lie and they gain more power. So you have to speak up and say, hey, that's bullshit. You're lying. That's stupid. No, that's not a man. That's a woman. That's a man who thinks he's a woman, but he's still a man. Sorry. That's how you stop the craziness. And you have to do it with everything. All of the lies. You just got to say the truth. <laughs> speak up. So that's our best chance, I think, as normal people to prevent this happening is to speak up and tell the truth forcefully again and again and again in the beginning before they get power. Once they get power, run, get out, <laughs> run away. That's my next advice. If you live in a country like this and they get power, these crazy people, and you you know they're lying, leave if you can, get out, get out, because it's going to get really, really bad. All right, let's keep going. Well, this is a great question from Philip because it's the exact question, he's asking the question that I ask because I see this happening in my own country, the United States. Philip says, the main question I, I, with this book is, what happens when people are aware, they see that their country's going in the wrong direction, that this is starting to happen, this craziness is starting to happen. But they're in the minority. They're, they're not the majority group. Most people are like the animals. Ugh, and they're just following. And there's a small group that sees what's happening. What, how can we resist the majority, the big group? Well, again, you have to speak up forcefully. Now, the good news is this. It's not usually numbers. It's not, or numbers are not always most important. It's the energy and determination. So many times a smaller group will win. Many times, if you look at history, politics, smaller groups win all the time when they are more motivated, more energized, and just tougher, and they fight much harder. They do win, and especially in politics. Because most people are like the animals. They just, uh, they just will follow along the strongest leader. So if the small group that's resisting, that's fighting, if you become the strongest group, the most forceful, right? The most tough, the most determined. You will not quit. You will not give up. And you speak the truth and, uh, and you fight really, really hard. Well, then the majority will start to change and they'll come to your side because the majority, uh, I mean, this is just sad, but it's human nature. The majority just follows the powerful. So they'll follow who they see is the powerful leader. That's why the animals, when Napoleon does all of this, they don't fight him. He, clear, he has all the power, and he's got the dogs, too. And they just very easily, immediately, they just change over and, Oh, Napoleon, oh, you're, the, you're the great leader now. So that's the answer, the best answer I can think of, because I see it happening in my country, too, uh, with all this craziness. But um, we just got to fight, 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 fight. And then my second part of the answer, again, is if, if you're losing, if you lose... If they get power, you should have an escape plan. So fight hard, but maybe even now, because <laughs> like I have an escape plan. I'm living in Japan now. So I go to the United States. I live there part time, but if they get power, they almost got power recently. If they do get power, um, I'll be in Japan. <laughs> so that's my plan. 
Yeah, we were just, Rosalind says, we were just like a battery for our government. The Matrix, right? The movie The Matrix. Hey, the, Ma the movie The Matrix is a good one. It has a very much deeper meaning, as you probably know. So, go watch The Matrix, right, with uh, Keanu Reeves. It's a cool movie, very entertaining, but it has a lot of messages like this book, actually. Very similar, right? Seeing the truth. I like professional pretenders. Yeah, that's what actors are. They're professional pretenders. That's exactly what they are. Think about it, right? I'm not saying that's bad. There's nothing wrong with it. But um doesn't make them experts about politics or society or families or anything. So why do I care what some professional actor or pretender, why do I care what they think about any other topic, right? I don't, it doesn't matter what it is. Economics. Why do I care what they think about economics? They don't know anything about that. They don't know anything about immigration or military or history or anything. A lot of these people are not so smart, okay? I took an acting class one time, and they're not very smart, a lot of them. It's not, of course, everybody's different. Some are, but, you know, you don't need to be intelligent to be an actor. It's, it does not require intelligence. It requires different skills, so... I think it's very healthy to not trust celebrities and don't worship them. They're not these perfect people. It's all pretend, you know? All that beauty, so much of it is just makeup and lights and clothing. If you saw them, like some of these women, you'd be thinking, oh, they're so gorgeous, they're so beautiful. If you took all their makeup off and no hairstyle, just like they wake up in the morning and put them in just normal t-shirt and clothes, they might not be so, a lot of them would not be so special. They may be pretty, still pretty, but not, oh, gorgeous, oh my god. You know, a lot of it is illusion, it's pretend. Like I said, it's, you know, when you're seeing them in movies, when you're seeing them on TV, when you're seeing them at events, they got teams of people working on their hair and their face and their clothing, they get plastic surgery. Oh, man, you see them up close, it's different. And the, for the men, it's the same. So, no reason to think they're these great people. They're not. They're not. Maybe, you know, you have to look at what, what else did they do in their life? Are they, did, are they really worth respecting or not? Or what else are they doing besides pretending? They're, they're great. I think mo there are many, many, many people in the world who are not famous, who are doing much better things and truly helping people or doing very amazing things. And those are the people we should look look to, to admire, at least. Well, this is a good... Iwana says, you know, Stalin was a psychopath and had no remorse. That's why it's easier for them to get power. Exactly right. So, again, um, that's who's attracted to this. People who don't care about others. All right, well, I'm going to end this now for our... Everett Singlish Club, Facebook people, I'll stay on here for a few minutes with you. But, as always, go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com, join my VIP program. I'll be back with Chapter 6 next week, Chapter 6. So, thank you very much, hope you enjoy this. On to Chapter 6 of Animal Farm next week. EffortlessEnglishClub.com Get all my courses at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Lots of love to you. Bye for now.